Welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen. It's really two programmes in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a programme about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colourful. Maximise the flavour. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimise the risk. So welcome to Graham Care's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. And welcome back once again. Now this is that wonderful opportunity of us to get our heads together and see whether we can get something which is really going to minimize risk and get some flavor going. And, uh, and this one is a sauce actually. It's a great sauce and it's actually somewhat like the great sauces that you can get from Europe and all over the world. Um, but this one um, is important, you know, because it deals with a flavor that everybody loves. Now let's see whether that's true. Do you love French onion soup? Mm -hmm. That thing with a crusted with the cheese. Well, we'll clear the cheese off for the moment and just summon up that flavor once again. OK, now that's a really popular flavor. That's important with a, um, uh, something like this. Now, you see, here is a piece of food. It doesn't matter what it is, but that's a piece of food like that. Now, it's very important when you put a sauce over the top of a piece of food like that, that it doesn't actually fight the food that you're serving it with, and, and quite a few sauces do. So what I love to try and do in this day is to bring a sauce around to get underneath the dish, to get up underneath the food and make something more of it, especially when I'm not using a lot of fat and a lot of salt and a lot of sugar, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do today, create an onion sauce, marvelously carameled onion sauce, and then show you what to do when you've got, you know, Thanksgiving and a load of turkey afterwards, and a great dish to do with that. Lots of comfort. All right, come through. Right, I need to get on with this because, you see, the first thing that I would do in this case is to take just a little oil and put it into a hot pan and start the process going. Now, um, what I've done here, just to show you what it looks like, the oil that I use is a little olive oil. And, by the way, that is different from the normal olive oil. This one has been deodorized, so you don't get that full, pungent, extra virgin olive oil thing, which I love and which, you know, Gourmets all over the world just extol. But in this case, I just want something which is right down in terms of flavor for those of you who are not into that kind of thing. So ah, this little charming little fellow here is sesame. Oh, that's toasted sesame oil. And what I do is I put in about one sixteenth part of toasted sesame oil. And now I know Trina's going to say to me, stir with a knife and stir up strife. Um, it's one of those things in our family. Um, and that then has that toasted sesame uh, taste, and it's wonderful. Now, I'm just going to put a quarter of a teaspoon full of that. It's almost as if you're saying, like, why bother? And, well, it's a signature item, and you can, because it's complexity. When you reduce fats, you have to come up with things that are genuinely tier upon tier upon tier of flavors and colors and textures, and it's wonderful. Okay, so we drop that down. Small sizzle as it, there we are, you can hear it? Good. Um, as it hits the pan, and just stir it all around just to be able to get those onions just going fine. Now, there is a seed, uh, a couple of seeds which can go wonderfully well in this. Now, here's a seed on, on this side. Those little seeds are called caraway seeds, and these are dill. Now, I wonder whether you can see the difference between the two. They are really quite different. They've got different functions that they play in flavor. But that little seed there is the dill seed. It's a wonderful seed. Of course, it comes from dill, and it's dried, and, uh, and they, they last forever. Well, more or less. And here is a caraway seed. It sort of looks like a little tiny dried banana. Huh? And those go into the dish. I don't want to waste anything. Um, but I take one teaspoonful each of that. Now, those put into the onions, 
they again, they get underneath the sauce and they come up through it and the flavors are extraordinary. And the moment that you start to fry in those and, and it hits the pan, experiment, get down, get down close to it and it starts to come up and get you, okay? Onions are interesting things. I've just used an ordinary yellow onion just so that everybody can do this. But here's a Walla Walla. Um, by the time these come up, everybody goes crazy because this is in the state of Washington, the United States, and these are wonderful sweet onions. And just add that extra sweetness to this dish, which are great. But as I said, I've done this with a regular one. The Walla Walla, when it's dried, out of season, looks like that. And this one is a Texas 1015, which means on the 10th month, on the 15th day, they plant it. And that's a nice sweet onion as well. And there's a Maui and a Vidalia, which comes from Georgia. Um, I've tried to find out whether in England, whether we have sweet uh, onions, and apparently we don't. So I know I'm going to get 3,000 letters telling me, of course we do, old chap, you know. But anyway, send it in if you want to. Always interested in hearing. Okay, now, when that's frying, um, it fries for about five to ten minutes. And I'm being sort of elastic about that. It depends how hot you do it. But on a medium-high heat, you can get some idea about how dark that can get down. See, that, that's before and that's after. So it gives you some idea about how dark it can be. All right, so that's doing there. That smell of, of, the, of the seeds are coming up brilliantly in that as well. To be able to get the... Um, texture off the bottom of the pan and into this dish is an interesting job. We do it with two things. One, which is a cup full here, that's a cup measure, of beef stock and also a cup of red wine. Now, if you're not into the red wine thing, I use the alkaline stuff just in case. But if you're not into that, you could double up on the beef stock. It'll show a difference, frankly, but I don't think it'll be a bad idea at all. So, just if, you know, you feel like that. And if you say, ah, that just the moment you've got to the beef stock, I can't go with you because it's too complicated. Get a can of beef stock, get um, some thyme, peppercorns, and a few pieces of clove and a bay leaf and some parsley, and nice herbs, and put them in a little mesh ball if you like or just chuck them straight into the saucepan and just brew it up for about 10 minutes. It just makes all the difference in the world. It's a very quick way of doing stock, okay? And, whoops, I normally pour in the red wine first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Eight um, ounces. That's one cup, you see. Now, see the color of that? That's why the red wine is such a good idea, because the color mixes with a color which has now come off the bottom of the pan take all the advantage of every residue because that's where the flavors of the onion combined with the seeds together and have drawn out this wonderful flavor. So just get it all off the bottom. And here now is one cup of that beef stock with just that little extra herbal touch to it. And um, build the heat up underneath that and get that bubbling and nice and hot. Okay, good. Well, this is going well. well you see how simple it is? Very simple idea. Okay. This is the standard way that I thicken things. Um, as you might know, this is the arrowroot deal. Arrowroot, um, in this case, has got about one and a half to two tablespoons full of arrowroot. Normally, if you've got a cup, eight ounces of fluid, you put one tablespoonful for eight ounces, and, uh, and that thickens it nicely. Um, in this case, I put just a little bit more. I've got just a little bit more. I've got almost two tablespoons full of that, uh, of that mixture going together. Okay. Now, because this is straightforward starch, it means that the moment that it hits a, a hot pan, it immediately clenches up. So if you've got a real um, heat underneath that one that I have here at the moment, it's sort of brewing up nicely. Um, if you will do that, what will actually take place is little you know, dumplings will form off the bottom of the pan. That's not what we want. So you move that off the pan base there and just stir it in. Now, you'll notice that this is the starch before it cooks. The starch before it cooks is that milkiness that it has to it. But now as it's absorbing, you can put it back onto the heat again. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's remarkable. I mean, just look at it. it you see, it, it doesn't need to boil to thicken. It is just so soft. And when the milkiness goes out of it, the color comes into it. And look at, look at the color. 
that's in that. It's just delightful. Now, because it's so brilliant, and because the arrowroot is so glossy, you could actually leave it just like that and just serve it. But I've got an idea that if you want a smooth sauce, if you don't want sort of all the bits of onion all over it, um, then what you can do is you simply slosh, just, well, I'll just show you a little bit of this, just slosh a little of it into a blender, all right? And um, put the lid on the top and just give it uh, at high speed, just run it for about, oh, I don't know, 30 seconds. I haven't really timed it to be sure. And then take a cup of, in this case, I've gone to the absolute apex of gastronomy, is a turkey, a hot turkey sandwich. This is bread underneath and then, you know, the turkey on the top. Um, all right. Now, in this case, you simply take a spoonful of it and dress whatever you're serving on the top, like so. And it's thick, but it isn't, you know, that thick. It, do, it doesn't mask in terms of flavor. It has a wonderful appearance. Mmm, tastes good too. And this one then, if you want to get it really thin, thank you, uh, you then pour this. But look what happens. When you, when you do it with this, it's a very nice, thick, glutinous kind of sauce, but it loses some of its um, uh, sparkle, doesn't it? And because the sparkle comes from the lights hitting this with the arrowroot. But what you've actually done, you've taken the white of the onion and whizzed it into that and kind of, I think, lost it a little bit. I put a little parsley on the top of that if I was going to serve it like that, but I'm just really wanting to test the sauce itself, just the sauce. So there's the basic technique, simple one, isn't it? Just put it together and great dishes can be supported from underneath. Really, the interesting thing is that this can make a tremendous amount of difference when it comes to numbers. So, <laughs> I've never really sat down to a piece of turkey smell than the sauce like that, but it's the sauce that I'm really getting at at the present moment. Okay, get back to the taste of that in a moment. See, that is the, the glory of a sauce which comes under something and lifts it up. By the way, thanks for letting me know about screwing up the paper. I will draw on the other side later. All right, um, now... This, these are the numbers, and this is how it works. Uh, the first one here, uh, 180 calories, in, in the Minimax one, actually just gets to be 84. Right? And then we get to the fat, which is just one only gram of fat as against 13. Saturated fat is absolutely zero. And that gives me about a 10% um, of, of uh, fat from calories, and, and that's really good. Uh, cholesterol is down to 12, and in this case is zero, and then sodium is 20, and then just a couple of grams of fiber at the end. So that really works out very well indeed. So it's just a question of the taste, as it normally should be. Now, here the darkness is there, the quality is there. Ah. Mm. It's amazing. How sweet that is. That is a sweet thing. And it rolls over the taste. It's got that slight smokiness which you get from sort of cooking for quite a while. And I can really taste the caraway seed in it. It's really good. That, that works well. Okay? So that is something that you could use for... I, I, I imagine you're into it already. Now, I'll show you a very interesting idea when you've had Thanksgiving or Christmas, something like that. You've got a turkey left over and ham, all right? and mound of potatoes, and it's steaming hot and gorgeous. Come along. Oh, lost my glasses. <laughs> Nearly lost my glasses for a moment. OK, now here is the sauce. It's, it's on the go from uh, just a little while before. I've took out such a lot of it, but I think just stay nice and cool and or hot, and we'll deal with you. All right, now let's say that we've got uh, the typical Thanksgiving turkey sliced into it piece of ham on the side, and the, you know it's the day after and you're wondering what to do with the leftovers. Well, this is one of the things that you can get to. And let me show you, first of all, um, 
what it looks like in terms of meat size, because I, I know that not everybody has a pair of weighing scales. If you go to the deli, now uh, I'm just simply taking us to the place that if it isn't Thanksgiving, Christmas, and you want to do this anyway, so go to the deli, and ask them to slice it real thin. I mean, so thin that you can read the other slice. You could drape it over a newspaper and read the newspaper through it. Uh, so it's that thin. So you can get two slices of ham and perhaps a whole slice of turkey. Uh, is it going to see where I am? Ah, ooh. And another piece of turkey, and that would give me about three and a half ounces of meat altogether. All right? So there's the portion. That's the portion size. Very thin slices. If you're doing it yourself at home, I've no doubt it could be thicker than that. So what you do is get a little bit of oil, just a tiny drop of oil, and um, if you've got cereal bowls, cereal bowls normally contain about eight ounces, so uh, get a little bit of oil into the bottom there, and, and measure it with a measuring cup. Just pour it into the top, make sure that it works. And then take a, a slice of ham and drape it in on the side until it sort of half covers the bottom. Then take the other, there's the piece of, of uh, turkey there, and fill up that side. <laughs> then you can just sort of chuck it in at will. Uh, there we go. It's a nice portion. I don't think, actually, I, th I have a sense. I couldn't see the other side of the weighing scale, but I have a sense that it was just a little over. So I want to keep it to three and a half ounces. All quite low fat and very lean ham. OK. So there it is, over the top. Now, this is a russet potato, quite an ordinary one here. Um, about eight russet potatoes gives you about three and a half pounds. And um, can you time me for a moment? Anyone got a, a stopwatch? Ready? Go. OK. Um, I, I need to be timed. I'm not out for a world record. I'm out to make a point here um, about, about peeling potatoes. <laughs> I was in the army once and had to do this sort of thing just because I was who I was. Matter of fact, what I did, I said to the sergeant on the, on the line, you know, um, uh, I said to him, what's that? He was holding a, a little yellow piece of material on the end of a, uh, a, a sort of spoon. It was about to serve me with it. And he said, yours is not to reason why, yours is to eat up. And so I took it and I shaved a piece off it and sent it to the Ministry of Food. This is in England. Uh, and asked them for an analysis about what this was, because I was interested. And uh, two weeks later, the commanding officer sent for me and said, did you send this to the Ministry of Food? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, you're, for your information, it is Yorkshire pudding, and you have two weeks confined to barrack. March out. And so that was my first time of, ha of getting KP and having to do you know, the work. How, how long did that one take? Minute. Hey, one minute? One minute. One minute. OK, now, here's the point. It's one minute of personal KP labor. Do you want to do that? I don't know but where you're coming from. But you can get powdered potato, and you can short-circuit all of that and get to it immediately. The only difficulty is that I find with powdered potato that it's kind of floury. For me, it isn't the same as fresh potato. So one minute, you've got eight, eight minutes to peel the potatoes as against sort of uh, opening the package and going for it. So it's your choice. Uh, into uh, warm water, one eighth teaspoonful of salt, bring it to the boil, and cook it for just 10 minutes. Now, after 10 minutes, which is how long this has had, just strain them out through a colander, and then, I think I've gone crazy, um, then what you do is just pour it right back in again. Now, when they're completely dry, they've got enough moisture locked up in those potatoes. It's amazing, actually. Um, just how much there is. And for 10 minutes longer, you put it on a low heat and put a towel on the top, and they steam out. And so what um, was a waterlogged piece of potato is now perfectly cooked, and that has a sort of floweriness on the outside, you see? Now, that is perfectly cooked potato. Believe it or not, chefs in London actually... Um, get to have to go through a test to see whether they're going to work in a famous hotel. They have to cook boiled potatoes and make them come out just perfectly like that. All right, so put that into a, a mixer and just run it slowly. And I've got here about um, half a cup of buttermilk. And, you, you know, some potatoes are drier than others or wetter than others, and you're going to have to sort of work that through yourself. 
So then about one eighth of a teaspoonful of additional salt onto the top. Um, some freshly ground white pepper, which is really just black pepper with the overcoat knocked off it. Um, but this way it doesn't look like it's, you know, somebody's mended the roof on the top. And just simply curl it round like so. And then this is, a, this is an intriguing idea. This is a nutmeg shaver, because it's hard to grate nutmeg. And there are little shaves of nutmeg going down there. Not too much. You don't want it too nutmeggy, but just enough. But again, about a quarter of a teaspoonful would be fine. All right, so that is all whipped up, and it starts to sort of uh, um, combine together. Very low speed, all right? Good. And now, just take some of this. Now, this can be hot, or in this case, of course, it's cold. But you take a spoonful of it, and if you're doing it hot, then it's, it's quite easy to do. Uh, just simply dash it in on top there and smooth it out so that it comes not quite to the lip. All right? And then just move the little bits of um, the extraneous pieces of ham and turkey back from the outside. Um, then the way that I like to do this is to put, if for a family, is to put foil on the top of it, stick it in the oven, and just heat it up. All right? Then everybody gets it nice and hot. Put a, a plate on the top. <laughs> This is the time when you pray. And just um, put a knife underneath, and it should all... <laughs> I said this is the time you should pray. And it all comes out and looks absolutely marvelous, doesn't it? A nice mound of, of the meat over the top. And then with that spoon... Where's the spoon? Uh, you just make a depression on the top there so as to hold some of this. When it comes out, it's hot. It's gorgeous. Then um, take the sauce that you've made and simply pop the sauce over the top like that so that it runs like lava flows down the outside. And then a little bit of, uh, of parsley uh, rain down on top, all over. In fact, when you're doing dishes like that, just overdo it a little bit more. Throw a little parsley around the plate as well and it looks great. Great. Good. All right, now you see, you remember that technique here? They are now on this low heat, steaming through. It's really hot, steaming towel. You could use it to shave afterwards. Just comfortable food. All right, now there is the dish. Let's see how this compares with the sort of thing that I did earlier on. It's that famous hot turkey sandwich. Um, so there it is on the dish. Now, look at it for a start. It's glistening as it glistened before. It's got nice texture to it. Looks pleasant on the plate. This one is the standard with whipped potatoes on the side or bread underneath it and slices of turkey and that cream turkey sauce. Let's compare the numbers and show you just what this looks like. Okay, um, believe it or not, the thing that we have used so much in the past um, is 893 calories for that, that size there. And in our case, we've dropped that to 422, virtually cutting the calories in half. 22 grams of fat drops to 3 grams of fat, and then of those 3 grams of fat, just 1 gram is saturated, which means that we've only got 6% of the calories that are actually coming from fat, which is really terrific. And especially around, you know, Thanksgiving time, that sort of thing. Okay, cholesterol is down to 33, and then sodium at 7, and virtually, you know, um, I don't have the numbers <laughs> today for fibre. Well, that's because I had cereal for breakfast. Um, so, that, uh, those are very good numbers. Now, all it really takes is to actually see what it looks like when you carve into it. And actually, as the family carve into it, they can eat it like a pie. You cut a wedge of it, and there's the, the hot steaming, well, you know. Uh, mm. And the ham, that's like salt it. And the turkey, and the potatoes with the buttermilk under them, just that touch of nutmeg in it. And that sauce goes so well with it, it's just wonderful. All right? So I really hope that you enjoy it, have a wonderful time. Don't forget, Minimize the risks in things, maximize the flavor, and I'll be back with you next week. God bless. Bye.